God's grace be with you, my friends. We are into Memorial Day weekend, the unofficial start of summer, the time where things become looser as we move into a different season in the life of the church. You'll notice the colors are now green, representing what is known in the church calendar, the liturgical one, as ordinary time, which doesn't mean it's ordinary. It just means it's the normal, the green, which you see most of the time. With all of that going on, you'd think that it's summer and everything slows down and comes to a stop, and you'd be wrong, wouldn't you? Lots and things are happening with the kitchen and all of that fun stuff. Things are starting to relax around with COVID, and they're actually getting better at least here in this country and in this area. And so we look forward to new ways to regather as we once did. Memorial Day is one of those things where many of us will gather with friends and family and while it often gets overshadowed with barbecues and, ba- I mean, fry outs, excuse me, and backyard picnics and the things, the reason Memorial Day exists comes from a long standing practice way back when, back starting at the Civil War going on forward, but was not actually made a holiday until 1971. But I had the pleasure and the honor of doing a service once in a national cemetery uh, for a soldier who was many, many years my senior, and I remember sitting with him long ago when I was very young and very fresh out of seminary, and he always had this poem that he kept in his breast pocket, and it was the poem in Flanders Field, so I'd like to share that with you just as a slight remembrance, and then uh, I learned something new this year. A woman who had read that poem and meant much to her teacher then wrote a response to that poem, so I'll share that with you. So this is In Flanders Field by John McRae. In Flanders fields the poppies blow between the crosses row on row that mark our place and in the sky the larks still bravely singing fly scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead short days ago. We lived, felt dawn and sunset glow, loved and were loved and now we lie in Flanders fields. To take up our quarrel with the foe, to take you, to you from failing hands we throw, The torch be yours to hold it high, if ye break faith with us who die. We shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders Field. She heard this poem, Myra Michael, Mona, Monia Michael, and she wrote a response to say that we have not forgotten those sacrifices. O you who slept in Flanders Field, sweet sleep to rise anew. We caught the torch you threw, and holding high, we keep the faith with all who died. We cherish, too, the poppy red that grows on fields where valor led. It seems to signal to the skies that blood of heroes never dies, but lends a luster to the red of the flower that blooms above the dead in Flanders fields. And now the torch and poppy red we wear in honor of our dead. Fear not that ye have died for naught. We'll teach the lesson that ye wrought in Flanders field. So as you celebrate the start of summer, as you celebrate time with family and friends, as you celebrate normalcy starting to come back, don't forget all that has come before. Take a moment and give thanks for those who are willing to sacrifice their lives for us and celebrate all of that good news. Let's worship together. Oh, 
Please join me in this morning's prayer. We gather in the presence of a loving God who rejoices in the righteousness of God's people, who stands firm in the midst of suffering and torment, who holds the power to relieve suffering, who hears us even when we do not hear and sees us even when we do not see. Our God brings light and life to all who follow in God's ways, recognizing your righteousness within us, and make us your own. Amen. Sometimes the night is beautiful. Sometimes the sky is so far away. Sometimes it seems to stoop so close You could touch it, but your heart would break Sometimes the morning came too soon Sometimes the day can be so hard There is so much work left to do And so much you've already done This morning's scripture comes from Psalm 1. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on God's law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like shaft that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish.
So friends, today being the unofficial start of summer, the end of the school year, the end of Pentecost where we celebrated the birth of the church, we move into more of a summer feel and so we're going to do a series about the Psalms. Some of you may say, well, haven't we done that before? And I'll say, there's 150 of them, so we got some work to do. Today we're going to start though with just a little introduction to the Psalms for those of you who have forgotten or need a reminder or didn't go to seminary. So the word... Psalms literally means either song or song of praise or prayers. Um, there's a reason we sing them. There's a reason we use them for prayers and things because that's what they were intended to do. We often tell people, oh, David wrote all of the Psalms, right? We have that really beautiful image of him playing his lyre, little harp, out in the fields as he's a shepherd and singing to God. And it's a lovely image, but it's not true um, at all. David is ascribed to all the Psalms to him, much like King James is to the King James Bible, which many of you have grown up with, whereas King James didn't write any of the Bible, he just paid people to do it. All these songs, these prayers, these pieces of praise were collected and shared as a gift from the king in this idea. Did David write some? It's quite possible he did. It's also possible he just collected them. Either way, it doesn't change what they are. The Psalms in general are human words to reflect the people who wrote them, the time, their understanding, their relationship, their relations to God, to the the world, to creation, and to each other. In other words, they're just kind of the everyday understanding of what is in the world, just in poetry slash song slash prayer form. So there are kind of We'll call it five. There are lots of different varieties, but there's five main styles of psalms. Uh, There are psalms of prayers for help of an individual. Makes sense. There are also prayers then, known as corporate prayers, prayers for the whole group. Okay, there's two different kinds. There's a prayer of thanksgiving for an individual and also the corporate group. There's what is known as the hymn or praise, which are just sheer moments of praise. And then there's psalms that are instructive, that give you examples of how, of what, etc. So this is kind of all the psalms. There are 150 in ours. There is actually 151st psalm in the Apocrypha, which is the book, a section of the Bible that Catholics and Orthodox use. And if you go to seminary, you have to learn about it too, because it's kind of important. Uh, The Protestant church in general doesn't use it, but there is 151. We do 150. But we're going to start, fittingly, with Psalm 1. As you've heard it read already, I want to highlight a few key pieces before we talk a little bit more about some of the parts of it. But in general, when you hear in the Psalms this contrast between wicked and righteous, it doesn't mean that the wicked are these morally reprehensible monsters and the righteous have halos over their heads. It was a way to say, There are those who are righteous, which is in right relationship with God, and those who are wicked, who are those without right relationship to God. Does it mean the wicked are cut off forever, as some of the Psalms say? No. What it means is that we should all be striving for the righteousness, that right relationship. And the wicked are those who ignore the word of God and try not to do as we are called to do. So just to be clear, it's not a moral designation. It's just saying these are folks who don't know or choose not to, and they're not awful monsters. They're just not part of those who follow the right relationship with God. So just to be clear on that. So Psalm 1 then begins, Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate all day and night. It's an invitation. It's a good invitation at the beginning of the Psalms to say, you're welcome to step into this book, into this collection of songs and poems and prayers, not for necessarily like a guidebook, you need to do step A, B, C, D, but different ways and understandings to use, to read, to embody the Psalms. It's like an introduction in most books that say, here's what we're going to tell you, and this is how you go about doing it. And it goes through and it talks about the law. So a clarification on the law. When we hear that word, 
we tend to think of something that's set down, and if you don't do it, there's someone here to arrest you. You broke the law. Well, the law in this case means the Torah, which really translates best to teachings. So it's the teachings. The first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It's also known as the Pentateuch, which is just Greek for five books. You figure that one out. All of this is happening in this idea that in this law, in these teachings, are found all of the ways to live in right relationship with God. Now, I won't sugarcoat this. There are what's known as mitzvahs, which are the actual instructions, uh, and there are, or the laws, if you will. There are 613 of them in the Hebrew Bible. Obviously, it gets a little convoluted and some contradict each other, not surprisingly, and it gets a little difficult to follow. But take all that into account and recognize that the Psalms are inviting us in to start learning those, to take those teachings to heart to lead a better life. So we're going to get to this, and it says their delight is in the law of the Lord. So their delight comes in learning the teachings and learning God's ways. The joy comes in Torah because God's wisdom is contained and it sets a path for us to follow in that both wisdom and desire to form that right relationship. And in the same way, it says that those who are grounded or planted in God's teachings, the law of love, are free because of that grounding, because of that planting. And so there's a blessedness, a delightfulness, a happiness in having a structure in which to live one's life. So I want to take a little thing. If you are online watching this, you can download this from the page, a little graphic. Uh, You won't see it well here, but I'll put it up so you can read it as well. But there's a way I like to look at this piece that starts in this next part of Psalm 1. They are like trees planted by streams of water which yield their fruit in season. So I want you to think of the image of a tree. There are three basic parts to a tree, and I know you're going to say, oh, there's leaves and branches. No, no. In the tree world, you have roots at the bottom, you have the trunk, and you have what's known as the crown. So the roots, I hope, are self-explanatory. The trunk also pretty self-explanatory. The crown is the big leafy piece. Leaves, sticks, branches, limbs, whatever you want to call it. Fruit, flowers, all that kind of stuff. That's in the crown. A tree cannot live without all three. If one part of that is dead, the whole tree goes down. But I want you to think about it as we kind of look through this. And if you want to look and follow this or pop it up in another browser, however you want to do it, or just listen, your choice, the idea is specifically that there are these laws, these rules that are put forth not just in the first psalm but through the scriptures that tell us how to live. And while I could give you all 613 and we'd be here for about two days as I read them all to you, uh, I kind of distilled it into some of the most important pieces that I've experienced, that I see, and that I see reflected in our own congregation and in the world. So starting out with the roots, the root structure, the thing that holds the tree in place, that keeps it grounded and starts the whole process out. There are a couple pieces that are so important. We read this both in the Hebrew Bible and also, of course, in the words of Jesus in the Gospels. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. And Jesus adds to it, and love your neighbor as yourself. If you can't love God and you can't love yourself, you can't love your neighbor, you need to be able to be infused with that love. It is the bearing, the ground, the thing that holds you in place above all others. Whatever you do to the least of these, you do to me. In Matthew 25, Jesus tells all the listeners, all the would-be followers, that those who are the least by the world's standards are important to him. And when you abuse or ignore someone who is the least, you ignore him and his teachings. And in the same way, in Micah, we read, What does the Lord require of you, O mortal? To do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God. This idea that justice and kindness and humility are essential attributes of those who would be in right relationship with God. So from the roots, then, you go into the trunk. And the trunk is that big, stable piece, right? You've got to have a trunk to have a crown. It'd look kind of silly if it was that. It'd just be a bush, in that case, and we're talking about trees. 
There's one passage that has always stuck with me more so than anything else in the Gospels, and it comes in the Gospel of John in the 15th chapter, and it says, No one has greater love than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. The trunk, the thing that holds us steady, is that we do not live for ourselves. We live for others. We live for our congregation, for our family, for our community, for our world. And then you get into the crown, all the things, the bearing of the fruit, all of the different parts that are necessary. The leaves to keep the tree alive, the fruits to procreate and create more trees, and the flowers. It's important stuff. It provides homes and shade and all these delightful things. And there are a few that sound really easy, that are really hard, but instructions that we find both in Torah and in the Gospels that call us to live differently. Jesus says to forgive as you've been forgiven. And you remember he's asked, well, how many times? And he said seven. No, seven times seven. In other words, you keep forgiving because you are a forgiven people, hence your job is to forgive. Jesus and the Hebrew Bible tell us repeatedly that we are called to care for the widow, the orphan, and the stranger in our land, to take care of those who get forgotten so easily. And we're called to love our enemies and bless those who persecute us. Not easy. But when we start to listen and follow, to live into that right relationship, we too, if you can see this image of the tree, are planted firmly, we're watered, we're fed, we grow, we bear fruit. And our fruit then helps others grow and bear fruit in the kingdom of God. So as you begin summer, as we begin thinking about the Psalms as we move forward, as the trees are in their full bloom and assaulting me with their pollen, among other things, I want you to think deeply of how you are rooted. What are those roots of your faith that keep you going, that keep you grounded so you might live your best life in love for the risen Christ? Amen. I invite you now, friends, to join me in a time of prayer. God, we give you thanks that we may be gathered as your people, scattered in person, on computers, far away traveling. We give thanks for the great gifts that you have poured out on this place and all the ways you call us to continue your work in this world. We would ask for all of those who are struggling now in this time that your hands surround them, that you hold them close that they find peace and comfort. 
we would ask that you give us strength and courage that we too might care for those in need in this world. We would ask that you pour out your blessings upon us, not for our sake, but that we might pour those same blessings out in abundance on your world in need. We give thanks for the great examples that Christ gave to us through his teachings, his life, his death, his resurrection. We hope and pray that we might follow his path more closely that leads us on to a better understanding of what it is to truly love one another. We give thanks for all of the blessings, God, but most especially that of your Son. And so we pray as he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, my friends, as you move out into the weekend to celebrate, as you live out into the world, plant your roots deep. Be fed by the streams of God. Bear fruit. Grow shade. Be a place of refuge for all who need it. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Amen.